So Amanda Ellis is hosting this session, and um, this woman is a force of nature. Uh, Amanda was New Zealand's representative, so another Kiwi, loving the New Zealand theme. Um, Amanda was New Zealand's ambassador to the United Nations in Geneva. Um, she, longtime foreign uh, ministry official, she is a visionary, a connector, and the perfect person to have as part of our community new lead this year, helped me curate this session, helped curate the islands session, and I'm just honored to have her with us and all the women who will be joining her here on stage. Please join me in welcoming Amanda Ellis, who is Executive Director for Hawaii Asia Pacific for the Julianne Wrigley Global Institute of Sustainability. How about that mouthful? Welcome, Amanda. <laughs> Kia ora, how proud I am to be a fellow Kiwi. The world needs more wonderful men like this. We heard about our extraordinary young Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, who last year at the United Nations made history by breastfeeding. And she was asked a question about her baby. And she was asked, don't you feel terrible bringing a child into the world given this crisis of climate? And she reflected and she said, it's true, I could see this as a great weight of responsibility, but I choose to see it as the opportunity of a lifetime. And I'm absolutely thrilled to have extraordinary women leaders with me today who are all absolute standouts in their field, from government, from the private sector, from civil society, and from the world of finance. Mary Robinson is known for saying, the climate crisis is man-made and it needs a feminist solution. <laughs> so we have a fabulous <laughs> panel here today to take us through some of the solutions. I was in the margins of the G20 in Japan last month and there the leaders reiterated, and I quote, gender equality and women's empowerment are essential for achieving sustainable and inclusive economic growth. And of course, we all know that in 2015, all 193 United Nations members and leaders committed to 17 Sustainable Development Goals, including Sustainable Development Goal 5, to promote gender equality and the empowerment of women. And yet, can anyone tell me in how many countries gender equality is a lived reality today? Zero, yes, the answer, <laughs> correct, resounding from the front row. Can anyone tell me how many countries even have a legislative playing field that promotes gender equality? Zero, no, a few more than zero. Five, six. So there are currently six countries that do have a legislative level playing field which means over 95% of countries still don't. And that makes no economic sense. McKinsey estimates over $28 trillion is left on the table as a result. And the World Bank last year came out with a study, sorry, you can tell I'm a very boring economist, that showed that over lifetime earnings, $160 trillion is forfeited. So it doesn't make any economic sense, let alone moral sense. We know too about the diversity dividend. We know that when there are more women in politics, when there are more women in the private sector, the kinds of decisions that are made create a higher return on either investment or on the kinds of policies that are good for families, for the environment, and for societies at large. So why are there only 6% of women presidents? We are going to find out. So I am going to, first of all, give you a quick overview of these absolutely extraordinary women, and then I'm going to ask each of them an opening question for a conversation, and of course we are going to involve you too. So these trailblazers and innovators are women who have seen a problem, seen a solution, and set out to get it done. So first of all, Jennifer Morris, who is the first woman to be the president of a major international environmental organization, Conservation International. And you heard her speak earlier, but she really is renowned 
for the radical and diverse partnerships that she's able to bring together. And sitting to her left, Kristen Hull, who is the founder and CEO of Near Impact Capital. And fascinating for me to learn, Kristen is actually the designer of the world's first 100% mission-aligned investment portfolio way back in 2007. And I said to her on the phone, wow, who knew? And she's like, yeah, actually that's true. I guess if I'd been a guy, I would have publicized it a lot more. <laughs> and interestingly, the crash in 2008, she went up by 2%. And the average fund was down by 28%. Congratulations. Awesome. Now, her investments are gender lens sensitive, promote social justice and environmental sense, uh, sustainability. So you also heard briefly from Ellen Jakowski, who is the Global Head of Sustainability Innovation at HP, and what an extraordinary project we just saw, just amazing. That plastic art, amazing. And so, again, harnessing the power of women and has the most diverse board in tech in the industry. And finally, Laura Liswood, who is the co-founder and secretary general of an amazing initiative. She has founded the Council of Women World Leaders, women presidents, prime ministers, and heads of government, still the first and only, and going strong. And we were delighted to partner with Laura last year when she hosted us at an incredible event at the United Nations where the Secretary General headlined, the President of the World Bank came second, and the High Commissioner for Human Rights came third, along with her council members, and to promote women's entrepreneurship and to really promote sustainability. So we have a powerhouse on stage with us today, and I am going to begin with asking Jennifer if she could give us an example of a diverse partnership and perhaps tell us a little bit about she, how she has been working with HP to really showcase what can be done when women leaders in science and in conservation uh, have their voices heard. Thank you. Thanks so much. So um, I am thrilled to be on stage with Ellen here from HP. I think that um, one of the things that Conservation International tries to really do is, as I mentioned earlier today, reach out to new audiences. And one of those audiences that we're increasingly getting involved with now is, is, um, is fashion. And this is a, you know, fashion touches so many people's lives in the United States and all around the world. And, and you know, quite frankly, until this partnership we developed with, with Elle magazine with NHP, we've never really done anything in the fashion industry. Um, I mean, I don't know about you, but most environmentalists are not really fashion forward. So this was a breakout <laughs> thing for us is how do we work with a fashion magazine like Elle magazine, um, and if I could show the cover. We um, launched this with Elle. This is actually this month's magazine. And Nina Garcia, who's the editor-in-chief of Elle magazine, is a wonderful, incredible woman. She's from Colombia, and she really grew up in nature. And she grew up seeing the synergies between art, fashion, and women's issues and conservation because she saw the way that nature can inspire us to do new things just like art can. So we decided, she came to one of our events and she said, I'm in, How, what can I do? What can I do to use the fashion exposure, the L brand to really bring these issues of conservation and the importance of merging these communities together? So at a big gala that we had in Los Angeles last month, um, we launched this partnership. And in this magazine, get it on your shelves now, um, we have, it's featuring 27 women conservationists. It's the first time that Elle has ever done um, any issue and really any story on women conservation leaders. So it's, it's an incredible tribute to that connection between fashion and environment. And I will say that HP has been fundamental in this. This cover here is made of 100% recycled content. Inside the pages are 30% recycled content. And really that's a game changer for, um, for certainly for any fashion magazine. And um, we hope that this will be kind of the future of, of magazines to come. So we really appreciate HP's leadership in this. And it's the, the, when these were launched, so you have, of course, these incredible supermodels, which everyone picks up because they see that. When this was launched, in 48 hours, Elle had over 
um, a billion downloads, a billion views of this magazine, and it was a record wow. for the magazine. And they were just like, okay, when are we doing the next one? We're ready. Because <laughs> it's not only very, very cool and uh -huh. showing women leadership, but it's also showing the reality that people who read fashion magazines actually care mm -hmm. about women and conservation. And, and certainly these issues are, are being exposed to new audiences through this effort. So we were thrilled to be a part of this. And um, you know, we had just this incredible event where Nina just talked about the importance of women leadership in this space. And we hope that it will really push the fashion industry even farther. There's been some good things that are happening, but the fashion industry really needs to do a lot more in terms of sustainability. So that's another area for us. Fantastic, thank you. And I think it's so interesting to see how women's values actually do align with sustainability. And it's a matter often of educating in the way that you have. So it's a perfect segue to Kristen. With this very first fund that you did, looking through a gender lens and becoming aware that women were really looking for a way to invest their money that was actually going to help the planet. Tell us a little bit about the process and then how you've been able to scale that. Sure, sure. Let me see if I have a slide here. We do. Okay, so I run NIA, and NIA means intention and purpose, and that really makes sense to women to move their money and their investments in alignment with their values. And when I designed the portfolio, it was really about what was needed for people and planet to thrive on this earth together. And so we have six solution themes, and I'll get to those. I didn't call it a gender lens portfolio. Of course, all the companies would have diversity and leadership because that's smart investing and that's smart <laughs> governance. Um, then gender lens became a thing, and it turned out that I had baked a gender lens throughout the entire portfolio. But again, just because it was really the smart way to go about this, it was a great way to assess companies. It was a way to look at each company and see what they were doing to be really sustainable. And that meant that doing it with a feminist perspective. So at NIA, that's what we do. Um, we are also the first um, company in the US to be gen certified, which is gender equity now. And again, that was just an exciting thing for my staff to go through. We learned literally 100 different fun facts about what it means to have equity built into the company um, that we run. It also has served as a lens that we can use in evaluating the companies we look at for investment. So that's been amazing. We're um, the top highest rated B Corp. <coughs> and Mm -hmm. We're also the top highest rated financial services um, among B Corps. I think. Oh, I was going to say, I think that might say a lot more about the financial services industry than <laughs> what we're doing. But really, we are trying to bake this differently. We're trying to bring our values and let women know, and of course we have male investors as well, but to let women know that you can have your money be an extension of who you are um, and have it be working for you out in the world. And so um, quickly what we're doing is changing the face of finance. A women-owned firm is, um, actually there's just about 5% um, of financial firms that have women in leadership, but to be 100% financial, um, owned by women is about less than 1% of the firms that are out there right now. And so um, just by existing, we're already doing things differently. Um, but we also have a Change the Face of Finance internship program where we're welcoming in young women and people of color to teach them about sustainable financial practices. Um, this is what part of our portfolio looks like in the NIA community side, and that was one of the ones you referenced that we did early on. This one got started in 2010. Um, and then these are the themes that we use. And again, you don't see diversity and leadership on there because that for us was just a given. That was a starting space. Um, the six solution themes are what we decided need, um, that people and planet need. And so we're going to find those companies that are working on these six solution themes. And all of our companies are addressing these themes through their core product or service. It's not an add-on or a fancy CSR report, but this is actually what we're looking at, and of course they line up with the SDGs. Um, I would love to say that I was at that UN table when these were developed, and uh, I wasn't. And yet, <laughs> it looks like we were, because they're really, really relatable to the work that we're doing. And actually, you'll hear more about that when we talk about the drawdown and how we can invest for the drawdown solutions tomorrow. Um, here are how our companies line up with the 17 SDGs, and um, you'll see, I was actually really sad about this, that. Um, Peace and justice, we don't have a company with a core service for peace and justice. And um, 
I guess what I'd say is that once we achieve the rest of these, we will have peace on earth. <laughs> um, and yet, if you know of a publicly traded company whose core product and service is peace, please let me know. <laughs> I want to include it in the portfolio. Um, of course, we're activists, and so we do all sorts of engagement because there isn't a perfect company. And so we want to really show our voice and use our investor voice in that. Um, here are some of the companies that you know that you would find in our portfolio that are just doing really great things. Um, our performance has been exceptional for this type of a portfolio moving out of the index. And why that's important is that we really need to look at female investors because they do things differently. And here you can see that of all of the funds out there that are available for you to invest in, just about 5% are run by women. Um, wow and then fewer than that run by people of color. And why that's important for the work that we're doing here as far as investing into the future that we want is that women look at things differently. Our uh, financial performance um, is as good or better than our male counterparts, but when you look at these numbers, we run about 5% of the portfolios out there, and if you see the AUM, the amount of money in those portfolios is much less. And so what this little slide means is that with no offense to the beautiful white men in this audience, um, white men are running our economy by over 95%. And look where we are today. Wouldn't it look different if we had other voices at the table, other thoughts, other perspectives in evaluating the companies that we as a society invest in? And just to hop in there, there's been some great research done by the Peterson Institute, which shows that for companies that have around 30% of women on boards and senior management, there's a 6% higher return on investment. And this is a longitudinal study over 22,000 companies. So the data is pretty robust to back up your point. Absolutely, we're seeing that at NIA, um, mm. and we see it across the board. So um, also, I mean, one of our primary principles in investing is diversification, and so wouldn't you want to see that at your manager level as well? Absolutely. Right. That is a great segue for us to move to HP right. and the most diverse tech board that currently exists. And Ellen, I know that you ha have also been very involved in looking at the diversity dividend from scientists right through to supply chains, and wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that too. Sure, so um, hi everybody. Very excited to be on this amazing panel today. Um, tech has a problem with diversity. I think we can all agree that that is the case, and at HP we certainly understand that, and we're working to make changes. Um, but as has been discussed from the top, when our company separated from Hewlett Packard Company, now a little over three years ago, our new executive leadership team decided that uh, it needed to look different. So three years ago, they set out on a journey to kind of remake the fabric of who makes up our company and what it looks like and how it functions and how it leads the way for diversity and inclusion in the tech industry. So this is our current view of our board of directors. Um, and it looks very different than your typical board, uh, including our newest member, Yorkie, who just recently joined uh, one of the founders of Google X. Um, so this was a message that they were sending uh, to the industry, to our customers, to our investors, to our employees about how tech should be looking different, how uh, the openness and the innovation that uh, is created when you have a diverse workforce um, is so much more powerful than when it is um, more uh, focused. Uh, but not only are they, uh, is our company interested in diversity from the top, but what does our workforce need to look like and how does that need to change? We're a company of engineers. Uh, and how do we continue to retain and attract engineers at our company that also reflect that type of diversity? So uh, in terms of our female representation, 36% of our overall workforce is women. 31% of our full-time VPs are women, and that is up from uh, about 18%, I think, in 2015. So we've made significant strides, again, from that decision a couple years ago when we remade the board of directors. Um, so we're seeing changes within our own company, uh, and I can say I certainly feel them, and hopefully you can feel them in the products that you're seeing us turn out. I think they're some of the most beautiful, some of the most um, 
electric products ever. We're now, you know, doing incredible partnerships with Elle magazine, helping to change the way printing works um, in the publishing industry as part of this. So lots of new innovations are coming from us. Uh, but it also extends not just from the top or within our own workforce, but what about our supply chain? We have over a $50 billion supply chain, and that also needs to change as well. Um, we're going to hear a little more on Thursday about a program that we have uh, to use recycled plastics that we're collecting out of Haiti um, for ocean-bound plastic uh, issues to help stop the ocean plastic pollution problem. And because of the work we've been doing there, we've been able to attract the interest of one of the most well-known scientists in the ocean plastic arena, Dr. Jenna Jambach, who's responsible for some of the groundbreaking research. She and one of her colleagues at the University of Georgia a women's studies professor, Dr. Cuomo, uh, asked if they could come down to Haiti and study what's been happening in our supply chain from a gender perspective. What's happening with the waste collectors um, and, uh, and how are the female waste collectors able to elevate and pull up the community as we know from so much of the research. Um, so they've come down to Haiti and studied our female waste collectors um, down there and we're waiting the results. They're going to be coming out in early 2020. But rethinking how our supply chain works and what the gender makeup is there and making sure we have equal opportunities for all is incredibly important. And then finally, um, what does the future look like in tech, um, not just for our workforce, our supply chain, but also for our customers? How are we enabling and exciting women to study engineering, women to come and uh, be part of a company like HP? So we've deployed um, different elements to help encourage this community. For example, this is a picture of some students in a learning studio in a refugee camp in Jordan where we've deployed um, HP technology so that some of the refugee community could have access to this type of technology. Um, as well, we're partnering with other groups in the US like Black Girls Code. So there's clearly lots of opportunity. We still have a lot more work to do, but we're committed to changing our company, uh, what it looks like, and we understand the power of diversity and inclusion, and we're working to make a difference every day. Wonderful, thank you. And I am thrilled now to pass the baton to Laura Liswood, who not only was the co-founder of and is Secretary General of the Council of Women World Leaders, she was also a co-founder of the White House Project, which aimed to really change perceptions in the US about women as leaders, has written a fabulous book called Women World Leaders, and uh, has another book called The Loudest Duck, which I love, about corporate diversity. So really for me, she is the guru around unconscious bias and diversity and inclusion. And Laura, given that there is only 6% of women who are presidents, prime ministers, and 7% women heads of state, what do you think are some of the keys to unlocking this unconscious bias, hearing that 95% of the world is still being run by white men? What do you think the, the levers for change really are that we can begin to step on the pedal for? Well, certainly um, we know that when we look at these kinds of issues, and you know, the council, just to elaborate a little bit, is um, made up of uh, uh, 76 uh, women who have been or, or currently are president or prime minister of their country. So if any of you are freely elected head of state or head of government of your country, women, sorry, men, uh, we will uh, be pleased to invite you to join the council. Join yeah, we'll <laughs> wait, about, uh, wait about three months to make sure you stick. Uh, and then, <laughs> We'll invite you to join the council. So we have almost all the we have all the sitting heads of state, and women heads of state and government, and almost all the farmers. Um, but you know, there are still obviously roadblocks. All of us can acknowledge that uh, of the roadblocks. When I did go around and meet uh, the living women presidents and prime ministers at the time, um, they all articulated issues around uh, perceptions of leadership and uh, tolerance for mistakes for women was less than the tolerance for mistakes for men. And sadly, um, the current heads of state are saying, still saying the exact same thing, that the press over-scrutinizes them, I mean, all the things that we probably mm -hmm. know. So these unconscious things are still out there very much, and, and along with all sorts of structural issues, et cetera. I'm, I'm fond of, of, of quoting um, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, some of you will know this quote, where he has identified that 16% of men in the United States are six feet or taller, 16%, oh. uh, one six. But 57% of the Fortune 500 male CEOs are six feet or taller, which is four times the cohort. 
And I've done a bit of reading and some research and written a couple of books on this, and I have yet to see any research that uh, correlates uh, leadership ability and skeletal structure. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, we have this arc archetype of what a leader looks like, an archetype of what a leader looks like. So you know, all of this is out there. And I mean, the good news is very sophisticated companies, like the ones sitting up here, are very aware of this and working hard. You know, and one, of course, part of the challenge is, is that, um, as HP would be able to articulate, you do need a critical mass of, of women in whatever entity that you have. And that's why so, so many countries today, in fact, almost all parliaments uh, have gotten to critical mass in their parliament with some affirmative mechanism in place. Fascinating. Martin, I know, who uh, spoke earlier from the IPU, has done some fascinating research. And I was reading just a couple of days ago that of the top parliaments that have, the 50 parliaments that have the top representation of women, 90% of them now have quotas or special measures. Yeah, some sort of a So like fascinating right. to see that, uh, right. that requirement to actually shift the mindset. Well, you, the, the, the purpose of affirmative mechanisms is to break through uh, closed social mm -hmm. networks mm -hmm. and in-group favoritism. That's what these affirmative mechanisms are. And I, I like to use an example because it's very important, like what you do, is to see what the results are once you have that. And the, the example I have a tendency to use is the Norwegian example uh, where it's mandated that 40% of uh, corporate board seats must be of the opposite gender you know, that, because there were so few women in actually meant 40% women. And if the public corporate board does not get to 40% women, it's uh, delisted from the Norwegian Stock Exchange and dissolved as a company. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What a great model. Yeah. So you know, it's one of those things where they couldn't find any qualified women before the law. Amazing how quickly they found them after the law. <laughs> but what's interesting, because you touched on this, around what they've done quite a bit of research, because this is the longest running affirmative mechanism in place. And they've been looking not at financials, because financials, while very important, I think they're often correlative, not causal. But they have looked at governance processes, and they have found governance processes have changed with this critical mass of O's in a room full of X's. And they have discovered, for example, uh, that uh, women read the board materials. <laughs> what can I tell you? Uh, but, uh, but what's interesting about that is that now men are coming to the board having read the board materials. <laughs> what that tells you is that the very presence of the non-dominant group shapes and changes the performance of the dominant group. That's what that tells you, that that very presence alone does that. Second, they've uh, identified that more of the board decisions are actually being made within the boardroom, not nightclub, golf course, country club. So transparency levels, like, like you look for, are going up. Uh, third, they've identified that women will ask more questions they'll ask more difficult questions because of their unique experiences and perspectives. Uh, fourth, they've identified that men will have a tendency to look at the short-term impact of board decisions and women will have a tendency to look at the long-term impact of board decisions. Now, let me hasten to say the best boards look at both short-term and long-term. Yeah. Uh, men will have a tendency to look at the uh, shareholder impact of board decisions. Women will have a tendency to look at the stakeholder impact of board decisions, which are employees, the communities, and the environment. Now, of course, best boards look at shareholder and stakeholder. So it's a, just a really interesting controlled experiment on what happens when you get a critical mass of O's in a room full of X's. And so I like it because it's very, it's very clear what happens when you get that cognitive diversity mm -hmm. in a room. Yeah. Fantastic. And looking at those different trays and remembering collaboration, empathy, and kindness that were mentioned previously, in the spirit of such, our time is actually up. But we would like to include you all in a call to action. Last night I had an email from Pat Mitchell, who runs the Connected Women Leaders Network. And they are building a transformative global agenda centered on climate justice and its link to gender equality. And the invitation is for all of us to join and sign. And we will make sure that everybody it receives an email, you just need to click and sign and be part of it. But in closing, I would like to invite an inspirational and transformational leader, Julie Wrigley, uh, Julie Wrigley, who has started the Global Institute of Sustainability at ASU, where I am now privileged to work. Julie, would you please join us on the stage for a photograph? 
And okay, Judy is. is How much? Representative of the power of education. We have with us the power of civil society, the power of finance, the power of corporates, the power of government, and of course, the power of education. Julie founded the Global Institute of Sustainability some 15 years ago, and this was the first institute of its kind in the world with the quid pro quo that every student must graduate with a sustainability competency. ASU is now the largest university in the US with 117,000 students, each of whom graduates with a sustainability competency. And after she had tried to do this at her alma mater, Stanford, and they'd said, nah, uh, she found an innovative new player. And I think it's wonderful to see, Julie, that whole impact, that force multiplier impact that education has had. So represented here on the stage, we have these five critical sectors, and Amy Christensen, where are you? You are the glue. We need the connector, the collaborator, who brings it all together. So, a snapshot of these incredible women, and I'm gonna sneak in. Thank you. And a big thank you to the wonderful men who are here supporting and espousing these inclusive values. As Mary Robinson said, climate change is a man-made problem that requires a feminist solution, and all of us are feminists and supporters of women's leadership and gender equality to create the future we want. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Amanda. Amazing. 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 Amazing.